Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psycho Bible, babbling about psychology and theology. And I'm back with another commentary on a documentary, this time Cracked Up, the Daryl Hammond story. Yes, Daryl Hammond, the comedian from Saturday Night Live, best known for his impressions like Bill Clinton and many others. Well, apparently, he's a survivor of immense childhood abuse and trauma. So I checked out the documentary, and I wanted to make a video expounding on some of the aspects of trauma that the documentary brings up. And it really does a good job. Now, fair warning, there will be spoilers. So I'm going to talk openly about what they share in the documentary. So if you're able to watch it, do that first. But keep in mind, if you have a history of abuse, I do not recommend watching the film by yourself. Watch it with someone who can provide comfort or discuss with you the topics and feelings that might arise. If you watch it alone, you might get triggered and need support in the moment. Or you could just be one of those people who's like, nah, I don't need that, I can handle it. And I would still advise watching it with someone and talking about the topics that come up. Because you may say, well yeah, I can handle it. And maybe you can. Depending on where you're at in your recovery. Or you might just respond with more numbing and suppression of emotion, which is the very things that we need to stop doing. So we want to be able to feel our feelings, no matter how unfamiliar or distressing they are, but to do so in a safe and responsible manner. So it helps to have someone that you trust with you. So anyway, like most guys my age, I grew up watching Saturday Night Live, and Daryl Hammond was a staple on that show for years. Uh, longest running cast member. I loved his impressions. His Clinton, his Gore. One of my favorites was him and Will Ferrell playing George W. Bush and Al Gore during the debates. And he's playing Al Gore and he's like, I'm going to take Social Security and put in what I like to call a lockbox. <laughs> I just, that was one of the lines I would just keep repeating over and over. Uh, his Chris Matthews. Um, Dick Cheney, like his Sean Connery on Celebrity Jeopardy, like dude, he had so many classic characters. And it's sad to say that it's almost become cliche that our great comedians have mental illness or drug and alcohol issues. So sadly, I wasn't surprised about the topic of the documentary, but I was very happy to see that he actually got the help he needed before he succumbed to what we kind of call the SNL curse. And if you don't know, SNL is a history, at least with a lot of the older cast, of uh, either death by suicide or drug overdose or just going off the deep end in some way. Daryl was raised in Melbourne, Florida. His dad, Max, was a Korean War veteran with PTSD and a drinking problem. He had a very destructive rage. But he also was very funny. Daryl would say that he got his sense of humor from his dad. He was just, he said funny stuff. Uh, but yet, he had this rage inside him. And he, Daryl described how more and more his dad just wouldn't bother trying to, to rein it in. So he could get a rage in him when he was drinking or was triggered in his PTSD from the war. But what seemed worse for Daryl was his mother, Margaret. On the outside, she seemed perfect. She was a sweet little lady at church. Even Daryl's childhood friend, Larry, could not fathom her doing the things that he described. As the documentary goes on, we learn that his own mother was a childhood trauma survivor herself. And so she inflicted upon Daryl the same abuse she experienced. Some of the things he described were shoving his hand into an outlet, even like shoving it in, then she would back out just before uh, he gets shocked, uh, beating his stomach with a hammer, slamming his hands against doors. And then when she'd be questioned, she would just say she doesn't know what happened. By age 17, Daryl was hooked on alcohol, he was self-medicating, after high school, he went to college, and he actually he tried to get help. He went to the campus counseling center, 
uh, he was having flashbacks. He started getting flashbacks at age 19 and just get a rush of like fragments of memories of his uh, his abuse or pain and and feelings that would just overwhelm him and so he'd cope by cutting himself and the counseling center at the university just didn't know how to help him and this became a pattern like throughout his life he would go for treatment he saw went to mul multiple hospitals he saw multiple clinicians, received a variety of diagnoses, bipolar, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, and they, these clinicians just wouldn't know a thing. He got prescribed multiple medications, uh, and they just didn't know what they were doing. It's clear that they were operating off the old paradigm for trauma, or really the ignorance of trauma. One common misconception is that you can be traumatized only by a physically life-threatening experience, like war. Like I've heard people say things like, only a vet can have PTSD. So we tend to think of trauma as the event itself, something that uh, you survived just by the skin of your teeth, that you almost died, either like a house fire or a, a shooting or uh, just a trauma from warfare. The reality is that the event itself is not the trauma. Trauma is the reaction to the event, which I blame us in this field as well because we tend to use the word trauma and traumatic experience or traumatic event kind of interchangeably. Uh, but we should be very clear that some events, people can go through some events and depending on their resilience or their support system they have, the event may not leave them traumatized and others will go through an event and they will end up traumatized because the lack of resilience, the, uh, the lack of a support system, uh, the, multiple other factors that contribute. So there's actually two main types of traumatic experiences or categories for traumatic experiences. Uh, it could be an event, like a one-time intense experience of danger like surviving a house fire or a car crash that's type 1 trauma a recent intense event but there's also type 2 trauma what we call complex trauma which is a series of compounded experiences repeated over time it's prolonged especially in childhood unfortunately there's been a movement in the world of psychology to look at patients through a trauma-sensitive lens. In the old paradigm, we ask, what's wrong with you? And not necessarily in a mean way, but we're trying to figure out, well, what's, what's their disorder? Uh, when we look at the symptoms and we, we see, oh, they got depression, they got anger, oh, okay, bipolar. And that's the condition that they have that explains these symptoms. A trauma-sensitive or trauma-informed lens looks at the client who is self-destructing, hurting others, acting crazy, and asks, what happened to you? There's a, more of a nurture versus nature understanding of mental disorders and uh, the human experience. And so we say, well, for you to end up this way, for you to have these sort of reactions or this filter that you see the world through, and these impulses and compulsions something must have went wrong in development so we don't look at the person and say there's something wrong with you at your core but something wrong happened to you in trauma therapy we explain to clients that their crazy actions are actually normal reactions to abnormal experiences and we help them make sense of themselves like, well, of course, if you're a little kid and you're neglected all the time, you're not going to have trust of authority figures. And uh, if mom was in and out of your life, you're going to be clingy or uh, just have difficulty trusting that someone's going to be there for you. And of course, if you were hurt by your dad repeatedly, you're going to have an aversion or you're going to have a lot of pent up anger. So it makes sense, the feeling that you're experiencing, that to others may seem like an overreaction, 
Well, those overreactions are simply uh, the primary emotion from the original trauma resurfacing by some new event and then adding these, the emotion to the new event on top of that. So it seems like a lot of heat is coming at you, but it's really, it's not just the present experience that is explaining their reaction. If the trauma from the past has not been resolved, it's coming up in the present in different ways. One of the worst things a child can experience is abuse from a parent. The very person the child expects to care for him. The, there's no logic. The logic is gone when a parent abuses. Especially you know that, okay, I need this person. I need them to survive. But at the same time, they're threatening my survival. They're threatening my sense of peace and security and identity and worth. But I need them still. And at times they are loving. Especially when they're not constantly angry or constantly abusive or neglectful. So it's like the child can't make sense of this experience. So it, re it rewires the child's brain. It causes a dysregulation. And the child needs to summon a separate persona in order to survive that experience. So it has like a sub-personality to help handle those times of dysregulation. But at the same time, that dysregulation still needs a solution. And so the child copes through addiction. And it could be anything from sex, pornography, drugs, alcohol, even cutting. Cutting is a way of uh, bringing a sense of control in the midst of chaos. When there's chaos in your environment and a chaos inside yourself, there's dysregulation. And so there's a lack of control. There's an utter lack of, of power that the person experiences. So they want to take back power in some way. So if I can't control the, the pain I'm experiencing from other people, that I can control the pain that I experience. I can inflict pain myself, and I, that's something I can control. And that, that sense of power can be a bit addicting. So I often see cutting as having an addictive element to some extent. So in the midst of a traumatic experience, our body produces extra cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline, and it gives us all this energy and and if we're not able to actually resolve the issue, that, that extra energy is still present and it just becomes toxic. And so it causes stress. This is post-traumatic stress disorder. And the greatest predictor of PTSD is dissociation, the compartmentalization of experience. It's the third option when facing danger. So we often think of uh, the fight or flight reaction. But there's also freeze, which is dissociation. So when we have a threat that we're facing, we'll get the fight reaction if we believe we ha assess the threat and we assess our abilities and get the sense that we have the ability to fight that threat, to defeat it and send it away. Or if we assess our abilities, we're like, well, I can't defeat the threat, but I can run from it. I can avoid it. I can escape it. So that's a flight reaction. But freeze comes when we know we can't get rid of that threat, but we also can't run away from it when we're trapped. And so we freeze. And that's really a compartmentalization of the experience itself. For example, a child whose caregiver, uh, whose parent, a mom or dad, and it's a young child, they're not big enough to fight against that threat, but they also still need that parent, so they can't run from them either. They can't survive on their own. So they can neither fight nor flee. So what do they do when mom, who's loving at times, is also scary and inflicting harm upon the child? We have to dissociate in some way. We have to somehow take those painful experiences and put them in a box. And so that, that's what we call dissociation. So I was really glad that the documentary included commentary from Bessel van der Kolk. He's one of the leading experts in dissociation and trauma. Now I've, I've already read some of his other works when I was in grad school and taking my trauma classes. And so this wasn't in the documentary, but 
In Bessel van der Kolk's research, he's, he's identified three levels of dissociation. First, there's primary dissociation. That's the inability to integrate the totality of the experience. Uh, so it's broken down into fragments. So the experience means all of your senses that are taking in your, your experience, what you're seeing, feeling, you know, touching, um, hearing, tasting, smelling, all those should be integrated in a memory. But when it's traumatic, they get broken up. And so they're not even full memories anymore, or yet. They, they're just fragments, and they're stored in our body, not just our mind. They're, they're stored in our, if, if it's touch, then they're stored in our, our own muscles. If we, someone touches us a certain way, it brings back that, that fragment. If we smell something, it can bring us back in time to that original experience. Someone could say something or remind us of something from our past. Um, these traumatic experiences get stored all over ourselves, and they emerge later in things like flashbacks, intrusive memories, which could be narratives or they could be physical experiences because memories are, are both. Well, I'll get into that in a little bit. Or they could reemerge in nightmares. So that's primary dissociation. That's where aspects or fragments of the experience are broken up and we can't really recall the entire thing as a whole. So it's not integrated. Then there's secondary dissociation. And that's a further disintegration of the ego. Um, if you think of the soul, how we have the components of our, our thoughts, feelings, and actions, and they're all one whole thing normally, but, but in trauma, and as dissociation increases, those components get separated. And so it's like you're not even fully present in your experience. It's like you take on more the role of an observer rather than a participant in the memory, in the very experience that's happening. So you could be present kind of mentally, but emotionally you're cut off. There's a separation of feelings from experience or behaviors get separated. So people can have compulsions, but they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So there's just, there's a lack of wholeness. You see this, this is so key, this, this understanding of, uh, of integrity. So instead of wholeness, there's disintegration. And the third type of dissociation is probably the most popular, and that's tertiary dissociation. This is where now distinct ego states that contain aspects of the traumatic experience begin to form. And they can be rudimentary, just like, say, subpersonalities or uh, certain modes of operating that emerge and help us deal with certain situations, or they could develop to the point of complex identities with the different behavioral uh, components and, and uh, memories that are associated only with those personas and even just various traits is what we used to call multiple personality disorder we now understand it as dissociative identity disorder and that's in the extreme form of tertiary dissociation where there are some lesser extreme forms where it's more like certain self states that emerge uh, in personas and subpersonalities in the documentary, we see how Daryl is a classic case of primary dissociation. He had some inkling of his abuse, uh, but so much of it was repressed. In his SNL days, uh, he would sometimes make comments about his life like an observer. Like, huh, wow, I really did go through a lot. So there's some hint of secondary dissociation as well. Like, he just, he could remember things, but couldn't quite piece it all together. He couldn't recall the feelings it just, they weren't they weren't um joint the feelings and the memories but he still there was a, quite a lot that was missing too in his memories one of his biggest meltdowns was when they were going to do a mother's day special and all the cast thought let's let's invite our moms and he's like there's no way I'm doing that so he at least knew that mm, my mom not we don't have a good relationship 
And so they thought, well, why don't you dress up as your mom? And when he looks in the mirror and he sees himself dressed up as his mother, he, he has a panic attack. He just has a complete meltdown. And so there was something inside him that knew she's dangerous. And he couldn't all fully explain why. So you may be wondering, okay, why, why do we not remember everything? Why would God allow someone to experience such pain and not remember what, what caused that pain? Why, why dissociation? Why is this even happening? And when you really think about it, dissociation is actually one of God's gifts to help us emotionally survive extreme traumatic experiences. Because dissociation doesn't really, it's not a, a consequence for all trauma and for not all people who experience trauma. It's most common for those who experience complex trauma in childhood. Because think about it, as a kid, do you have the resources, the resilience, the strength to be able to make sense of being chronically abused by a caregiver? No, it would it would destroy you. It would bring emotional death. It would there's a sense of annihilation that would occur if you were fully cognizant of all the pain that you were being subjected to. And so for your own sanity at the time, some of those experiences need to be dissociated. They need to be cut off. So as Daryl said, my soul knew all along what my mind did not know or let me know. The mind is a miraculous creation. I love that. It's so true. It's really one of God's gifts that he gives us. Now here's the key thing though. He does not leave us there. I've worked with a lot of clients with gaps in their narratives. When we do our life timeline projects, I'll get a lot of clients who be like, well, there's a whole chunk of my life that I just don't have any memories of. I can't remember uh, what happened from age 5 through 10. And it bothers them. And they wonder if they were molested or had some other major traumatic experience that they just blocked out. And it could be. That could be the case. And so what I tell them is, well, let's just work with what we have, what we do remember. And what I tell them is that what I find is that God will normally fill in that gap in the right time. That in his timing, he will bring back those memories if they need them. And he'll do it when he knows that they are strong enough, when they have the resources, like a support system, that they will need to deal with all the feelings, uh, the dysregulation that will finally fully emerge when that gap gets filled in. For Daryl, the gaps really started filling in when he became a dad. See, previously he needed the dissociation to protect himself. His brain knew that he's top priority. His survival is top priority. But now he's a dad. He himself is not his only priority or the top priority. He now has a little girl to take care of. But now when he was in the position of needing to protect someone else, the dissociation outlived its usefulness. So when his mom called after the, their daughter was born and she offered to babysit when they need a break, he was flooded with images. Those images were saved up until he was strong enough to deal with them. Or when, hey, like it or not, you're going to have to deal with them because now your daughter's threatened, potentially. And so then all these memories come up, and they're, once again, they're still in fragments, but they're filling in more and more of the gaps. And it's still very overwhelming. And so one day in 2010, he attempted suicide. Now, he had been cutting for years, but this was an actual suicidal cut. Normally, cutting is not suicidal. It's uh, meant to be a way to feel, finally, and to control. Uh, but then he was so overwhelmed with everything he was feeling, he attempted suicide. And so he ended up going inpatient for three months. And he met Dr. Codby. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. 
<laughs> Finally, he had met a doctor who understood what he was going through. And this doctor, he went over all his diagnoses and all the previous assessments from all his past clinicians, and he threw them all out. And he told him that he is reacting in trauma. He gave him an explanation. One of the fascinating things about Daryl was that he color-coded his impressions. He would see a color before doing a voice. You know, Popeye was blue, Porky Pig was yellow, and he mentioned early in the documentary that he never color-coded anything red. So Dr. Codby kept pressing to get to the bottom. It's like, what was red in your childhood? You know, he had previous clinicians who helped him figure out, okay, there's something red in a box, there's um, a red room, there's a kitchen, there's red in the kitchen, and uh, so they narrowed it, oh, red in a box, okay, box, uh, there's, and finally it came to him, ah, the window in the kitchen, there was a red hibiscus plant in, that he could see through the window, and one of the other things that would always uh, trigger him would be a thumping sound. If someone ever knocked on a door in a way that sounded like a thump, and he it, it realized, ah, oh, the hibiscus plant, when it was windy, it would bang against the window like a thump. And as he came to that realization, and Dr. Copy is asking him, you know, you have 49 cuts, but there's one injury you have that is not necessarily self-inflicted, and it's on your tongue. What, what happened there? And so it all came together... When he realized a memory, there was an image that he imprinted when he was four or five. It was that, that red hibiscus plant got imprinted there. So when he was about four or five, he was in the kitchen and his mom was holding him tight and she was speaking sweetly to him and softly and he was feeling close to her. And then bam, she suddenly stabs him in the tongue. And the image that gets imprinted is the red from the hibiscus plant. And piecing that together was one of the breakthroughs for him. It was like that last memory that needed to be figured out. Why he could never uh, color code any of his voices or impressions red. He had such an aversion to the color. Because of all the pain that was associated with it. So this reminds me of... Uh, Frank Ockberg's description of the two types of memory. They see there's VAM, which is verbally accessible memory, and SAM, situationally accessible memory. Now VAM is autobiographical, it's sequential, it's, you can tell chronology, it's where you could recall a story at will or by someone asking, they can just simply, hey, tell me about a uh, time in childhood where you uh, went to a vacation spot you really enjoyed and you could jog your memory and you can go through your files in your head and be like ah yeah here there it is and you can just tell the story you can tell what age you were and what happened and, and who was around you and the, the senses and the experiences but with Sam you can't just recall those at will or by someone asking those get recalled only by triggers sees that the fragments of that memory are stored in your body and so as you touch something or hear something or taste something then that memory comes up and trauma memory is stored in both VAM and SAM if the SAM the situationally accessible memory outweighs the VAM the verbally accessible memory you're more likely to get PTSD but if the VAM outweighs the SAM, the SAM gets quieted through the repetition of telling your story. See, it's just, it can't stay in your body if now it's being verbalized. And the more you speak that story, the more it integrates. You can pull from the different senses and the different aspects of the memory, and it begins to find their, uh, to make sense as those different fragments find their place. And this is why the greatest tragedy of abuse is when we're not allowed to talk about it. See, after his mom stabbed him, he went to go stay at uh, some 
other family's house for a little bit, and then he came home, and Dad sent the mom to a hospital, and she was there for maybe 30 days, and when she came back, they just never talked about it. It was never addressed. The unspoken rule at home was, we don't talk about what Mom does, or, or what Dad does. Don't forget, he, he had his own rage and PTSD issues. And Terrell said, the worst crime is being expected not to tell. When someone's abusing someone, torturing them, they want the one they're doing it to to act like something else is occurring. That's one thing that bothers me so much when I'm working with clients or, or just friends, and, and they're so scared to say what someone in their family is doing or, or has done wrong or some other relationship. And it's like, if that person cared enough about not having their, their deeds revealed, then guess what? They shouldn't have done them to begin with. But we protect them. We protect our abusers. And we, and it gets distorted sometimes so that we know we'll get in trouble if we share. And we develop a shame over the experience. We get it to the point where we blame ourselves for what we had done to us. In the documentary, Bessel van der Kolk says, If you cannot tell the truth, you need to lock that reality away. And that reality begins festering inside you. Anything that cannot be spoken becomes an internal danger to yourself. And when your reality is not allowed to be seen or to be known, that is the trauma. And so like I'm saying, the victim learns to be ashamed of what was done to them. It's a completely backwards purpose for shame. Now, shame is sometimes necessary when someone is acting disgracefully and they, they need to feel the pain of how their bad behavior separates them from other people. As long as now they, there's a route for them to be accepted back into community and to, in relationship. But when you're shamed for not doing anything wrong, you're shamed for your, just, your existence, for your identity, for your, your dignity, you can... Uh, lose the distinction between right and wrong, between shame and guilt. Uh, we can be overwhelmed with shame, unable to tell the difference between our worthiness of acceptance and our moral failures. And so we just feel like we're bad all around, bad at our core, that there's something deep down within us that makes us defective, that makes us unlovable if anyone were to know about it, and we would never be accepted. And so no one can know the true us. So we have to hide it. We have to uh, divert people's attention. We have to uh, numb our own awareness of our shame. I love that one doctor told Daryl that he prefers the term mental injury rather than mental illness. See, Daryl's problems weren't contagious. He didn't catch them like a cold. It, it, they didn't just happen out of the blue. He was abused. He was mentally injured in some way. And so out of that injury, he tried to survive. He tried to cope. He tried to deal with that dysregulation. And as Van der Kolk said, one of the first steps is learning to forgive yourself for the ways you tried to survive. The addiction, the cutting, the bad relationships. All of them were just symptoms of his pain. He was reenacting how he was treated uh, in his relationships. He didn't know how to have a healthy relationship. He was reenacting the trauma. And so he had to learn to forgive himself. And as he was doing that, he also was able to see his mother in a new light. He got a vision of her. He saw her as a young girl. And he, and he realized how she was abused as well. And with this new lens, he was able to see how she was reenacting as well, and have compassion toward himself and toward her. I would say the strongest message of the documentary was the need to speak out. Whether you're the abused or an observer. So when you're the child, it's not always possible to share, but now, as an adult, now's the time to reach out for help. Share your story, find someone you can trust, Stop masking that pain through drugs, alcohol, sex, TV, whatever. You need connection. It's the, the pain of the trauma can 
lead you into isolation and, and make you believe that no one will understand. But God is putting people in your life who are going to be there for you and going to be able to walk with you through that pain. Are you willing to seek them out? So I hope you will. So anyway, there's so much more we can talk about when it comes to trauma. Um, this documentary is very good. It just opens up a whole lot more discussion. I hope my little extra insights uh, and exposition was helpful. Please join me in the comment section. Like, share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, uh, and share this video with others and get the help you need if you need it. Watch out for others in your life that you encounter who may need help as well. Alright, God bless.